ordinary people step out onto the world stage and accomplish extraordinary strides out of their own intellect and gallantry? Or is the stage really a set that was already prepared? While it is probably a carefully proportioned combination of the two, it seems often that the planets first have to be in alignment, and then the person must perfect the objective of that environment. When that happens, the course of history is changed forever. We often hear that timing is everything. Each week, for such a time, a chronicle of the age, we'll take a look at a place in time and the person who forever altered that time, as well as the time to come. Welcome into For Such a Time, A Chronicle of the Age. I'm your host, Kelly Drewley. You may have heard the phrase, the hand that rocks a cradle is the hand that rules the world. It is attributed to American women and their influence in changing the world. Amelia Earhart, Rosa Parks, and Susan B. Anthony all had a hand in significantly changing the world. They were pioneers, activists, and ordinary citizens who stood up for civil rights, women's rights, and breaking stereotypes. But one barrier they probably never thought or even considered would be broken would be whether a United States president could be a woman. Enter Hillary Rodden Clinton. In 2007, she made the decision to run for president of the United States, and in doing so, became the new pioneer to break the final and ultimate glass ceiling. New York Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton arrived on the 2008 presidential campaign trail on January 20, 2007, ready to fight. Her announcement over the internet was monumental in itself, using web technology to reach out to potential voters. I announced today that I'm forming a presidential exploratory committee. I'm not just starting a campaign, though. I'm beginning a conversation with you, with America because we all need to be part of the discussion if we're all going to be part of the solution. And all of us have to be part of the solution. Let's talk about how to bring the right end to the war in Iraq and to restore respect for America around the world. How to make us energy independent and free of foreign oil. How to end the deficits that threaten Social Security and Medicare. And let's definitely talk about how every American can have quality, affordable health care. By the time Senator Hillary Clinton officially stepped into the race for the highest office in America, few were surprised. The Clinton political machine was operating at full capacity and had long been armed to launch another Clinton into political overdrive. Some political pundits had rumored that her master plan to run for president had started back in the 70s when she was in law school dating Bill Clinton. Others speculated that her autobiography released in 2003, Living History, was a message to the world that she would be making a run for the White House in the future. Why else would she publicly address how she privately dealt with the Monica Lewinsky scandal and her husband, President Bill Clinton, unless she herself was planning on occupying the Oval Office? And with millions of Americans still enamored with the charming, albeit controversial, former President Clinton, there was no question that her campaign would gain many of his supporters. With the most recognizable name in the Democratic Party behind her, it seemed almost a foregone conclusion in January of 2007 that Senator Clinton would be the party's nominee. In April, Senator Clinton had a $26 million record-breaking first quarter fundraising drive, which she thought would be a huge lead against her opponents in campaign financing, turned out to be just a $1 million difference between herself and Barack Obama. And dollars weren't the only sign that all wasn't perfect in paradise. In August of 2007, both candidates traveled to the Iowa State Fair, but it was Senator Obama who emerged as a rock star with an excited crowd. 
Senator Clinton was starting to see that Iowa might be more of a challenging contest for her campaign than she originally thought. The Iowa caucuses on January 3, 2008, left Clinton in the dust with a disappointing third-place finish behind Senators Obama and Edwards. The Hawkeye State was the first of many setbacks to come for the Clinton campaign, and so their attention was immediately shifted to the New Hampshire primary on January 8th. Clinton and her advisors quickly recognized that they needed to change up the strategy just a little bit. So they threw a curveball into the mix. You know, I have so many opportunities from this country. I just don't want to see us fall backwards. You know, so. You know, this, this is very personal for me. It's not just political. It's not just public. The gamble paid off, as Clinton's unusual show of emotion helped her connect with the voters on a more personal level. She marched onto her first victory in New Hampshire and became the first female candidate to win a state presidential primary. She continued to win primaries in Nevada, Michigan, and Florida, although the Michigan and Florida results were not supposed to count because of the DNC rules violations. But in late January in South Carolina, it became an extremely contentious race, and it seemed to fall on the issue of race. The role of the senator's popular husband had to be reevaluated. It seemed that he had bargained just a little bit too much political currency on his almost religiously loyal black voting base. Comments by Bill Clinton that suggested that Barack Obama's campaign was a fairy tale cost his wife dearly in some of the southern states, including South Carolina. When we return, we'll take a look at the big one, a.k.a. Super Tuesday. V-Day in the race for the presidential nomination, February 5th, 2008. Super Tuesday. It was supposed to be the day that one candidate, either Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton delivered that knockout punch to the other. But what really happened confused and haunted us with visions of the 2000 presidential election. Hillary Clinton walked away with eight state wins to her credit, including some big ones with New York, California, and Tennessee, which pushed her past Obama in the delegate count. But Barack Obama came out of the fight with a 13-state sweep, putting together several small victories in smaller states and staying up on his feet. This would mark the beginning of the most significant divide of the race, one with which this nation has been plagued before, as one might harken back to the year 2000. The question, if one candidate has the most delegates and the other the most popular votes, can the delegate candidate claim a decisive win? That question would not be answered in this race, but as Senator Clinton took her lumps during the rest of February with nine straight losses to Senator Obama, her campaign once again fired back with an eye-catching new ad just before the elections in Texas and Ohio. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. But there's a phone in the White House and it's ringing. Something's happening in the world. Your vote will decide who answers that call. Whether it's someone who already knows the world's leaders, knows the military, someone tested and ready to lead in a dangerous world. It's 3 a.m and your children are safe and asleep. Who do you want answering the phone? I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. The comeback kid returned triumphantly with the help of that ad and gained big wins in Texas and Ohio, followed up by a double-digit margin in Pennsylvania. This gave her hope. With seven states left, she knew she had West Virginia and Kentucky in the bag. But at this point in the race, it became trying to secure superdelegates votes as well. She trailed Senator Obama by just over 100 delegates going into the finale of the primary season in Montana and South Dakota. It was ultimately just a few hundred by which he won. On June 3rd, Senator Clinton had won the South Dakota primary, but had lost the presumed nomination. The Illinois senator reached the magical number of 2118 and gave a celebratory speech to 17,000 supporters in St. Paul, Minnesota that night. Over 17 million voters headed to the polling stations for her, and depending on how you counted Michigan, Florida, and the caucus states, the Clinton campaign claimed that she led Obama and the popular vote with 18 million to hit 17, 
With the decision of Florida and Michigan delegates being seated with only one half of a vote for the DNC convention in Denver, there was a chance Senator Clinton could dispute the ruling and take it to a vote on the convention floor in August. The only other way she could have changed the outcome was if she could convince more superdelegates to commit to her before the convention. After a long and hard-fought campaign, Hillary Clinton was preparing to make an exit. It just took her a little longer than some might have liked, and a little shorter than her supporters wanted. Three days later, on Saturday, June 7th, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton conceded defeat and pledged her support to the junior statesman. Now the journey ahead will not be easy. Some will say we can't do it, that it's too hard, we're just not up to the task. But for as long as America has existed, it has been the American way to reject can't-do claims and to choose instead to stretch the boundaries of the possible through hard work, determination, and a pioneering spirit. It is this belief, this optimism, that Senator Obama and I share and that has inspired so many millions of our supporters to make their voices heard. So today, I am standing with Senator Obama to say, yes, we can! While many were initially concerned that the three-day delay for the Clinton concession could potentially damage her political future, her eloquent delivery, expressing her commitment to throwing her full support behind Barack Obama, quickly squelched those concerns. Almost immediately, the cries for a dual Obama and Clinton presidential ticket went from a murmur to a shout. But the candidates had both been fairly mum on the possibility. When For Such a Time returns, we'll take you back to where it all started for Hillary Rodham Clinton. Stay tuned.